Today we're going to be hearing from David M. Bauer on uh, gyroscopic weight loss and related topics. Go ahead, David. Here's a list of my topics today, and I'm going to try to make the presentation brief and directly to the point. Kinematics versus dynamics, kinematics of dy and dynamics of angular rotational motion, absolute versus relative motion and absolute space, Newton's pale experiment. Then I'm going to critique uh, Lathwaite's anti-gravity effect. You, you've probably seen the videos that describe this. Gyroscope and general relativity, just a couple comments, and an intuitive explanation of the gyroscope. I want to make a little digression here about barmaid physics. You ever heard of Ernest Rutherford? He was a very famous physicist. He was involved in uh, investigating the nucleus with alpha particles. He was the one who uh, shot alpha particles at a thin gold foil. Anyway, he liked things to be simple. He said once that, it, that if a theory were any good, it ought to be possible to explain, explain the theory to a barmaid. Well, in our explanations, pr presentations and discussions, we should begin at the point of agreement with others and try to get to the point of an understand, a mutual understanding. Otherwise, it's kind of pointless to go on. However, let me make a disclaimer. It seems that most people, and that would include physicists and engineers and philosophers, et cetera, consider the behavior of gyroscopes to be non or anti-intuitive to some extent at least. Now let's talk about some definitions. Mechanics, the field of mechanics is composed of statics and dynamics. And statics is further subdivided into geometry and stresses. You get the stress strain tensor at rest. You can also have a stress strain, strain, strain tensor with objects in motion. Dynamics is further subdivided into kinematics and kinetics with kinetic, kinematics being the geometry of motion, you know, it's a kind of a description of the motion. Displacement, acceleration, velocity, et cetera. Kinematics ignores forces and causes of the motion, whereas kinetics consider the, considers the forces involved in the cause of the motion. Kinetics, to make things confusing, kinetics is also known as dynamics, so. <laughs> there are, Formal analogies between translational and rotational motion. So uh, here's our point of understanding. I'm sure, I, I believe everyone is very, very familiar with translational motion. Um, it seems like in the discussions of special relativity, it, it really overemphasizes translational motion quite a bit. You know, the Lorentz transformation involves two coordinate frames in translational motion with respect to each other. But let's, we're going to talk a little bit more about rotational motion today. And there's some formal analogies. Displacement, r goes to phi, the phi vector. You have linear velocity goes to angular velocity represented by the omega vector. Acceleration goes from linear to angular, from an a vector to an alpha vector. Mass goes to moment of inertia, which is an integral over the whole object. And again, whenever you talk about rotational motion, you, mentioned, you, you have to define an axis of rotation. I forgot to mention that. And then you can define a torque about that axis. The torque is unique to the axis of rotation, and it's just uh, the force crossed, the cross product of the uh, radius, uh, uh, the displacement vector times a force. And uh, then work, you can have work can be done in translational motion. Work can also be done in rotational motion. Power, obviously in translational and rotational motion. Can you see the cursor also when I move yeah. the cursor around? And of course, kinetic energy, uh, you can have in the ca case of both translational and rotational motion. We have with angular motion, we have conservation of angular momentum, just as we have conservation of linear momentum with translational motion. You've all seen the skater, the, the famous skater uh, paradigm where the skater starts with the outstretched arms, it pulls into the body and the angular, angular uh, velocity increases. Now I'm gonna make a, 
transition into talking about space because everything, every type of motion occurs in space. My hypothesis is that space is relative with respect to translational motion. Now we know that Newton in his Principia postulated that space is absolute because I believe, I, I've tried to read his Principia and I, I got, I spent a couple of weeks on it and as is usual my practice, I, I don't usually complete things that I start, but it seems to me that he deals mostly with translational motion and he postulated that space is absolute with respect to both space and time. Well, time is absolute also. In other words, uh, you can define your state of motion with reference to absolute space, which means that velocity can be absolute. And there's a gigantic clock which controls time at every single part of space. Now, today we reject this concept because we don't know of any way to relate motion to space. In other words, you have to have, you have to define some sort of coordinate system to refer all motion to. Usually, if I were to tell my son that jet airplane is traveling at 600 miles per hour, he would understand that I'm talking about 600 miles per hour with respect to the earth. I don't even have to say that. But we could also talk about the plane traveling a certain speed with respect to a, a car or one of these motorcyclists that's going 100 miles an hour down the road. And it would be 600 minus 100 or 500 miles per hour. There's no way to tell if, if you were in deep space, you're, there's no way to tell if an object is really in motion or not. However, I would suggest that space is absolute with respect to rotational motion. And the reason I say that is, are, are you all familiar with Newton's bucket? Yeah. Well, you're familiar? Raise your hand if, if you're familiar with it. Oh, no, I can't, I can't see. But anyway, if we have a pail or bucket filled with water sitting on a table, and that table is fixed with respect to the earth, the, the, the water is going to have a level surface. And, and of course, me, I'm looking at it, I'm also at rest. What happens if I um, say I like suspend myself over the bucket and start rotating myself around? Well, I could rotate at any ang with any angular velocity. I'm, I'm gonna still see that water with a level surface because the water and the bucket are at rest with respect to the stars and, and space. However, if, if I start rotating that bucket, and started moving with respect to the fixed stars. Fixed stars is kind of a misnomer, but anyway, we will notice that the water, the level of the water will assume a curved surface. And I would suggest that, that the reason for that is because it is in motion with respect to absolute space. So I think space is, is relative with respect to translational motion and absolute with respect to rotation. So that's a way to distinguish rotational translational motion. Any discussion about this or disagreement, agreement? Oh, I can talk about this all day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This was my point about this is, and this is what I object to about people criticize uh, the church. The church said, um, if the earth is spinning, as you claim, Mr. Galileo, why doesn't it fall, fly apart? Yeah. This was an essential argument against Galileo, but most people ignore that and just proceed on saying Galileo was right. So this is an old, old argument. Well, there's also a bunch of people who believe the earth is flat and they can make some good arguments, which I can, I can defeat all their arguments. I can shoot them all down. Um, one, one person said, you know, if the, if the Earth wasn't flat, then pilots in an airplane would have to continually be pointing their plane downward to maintain level flight. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You just don't understand, you know. I mean, I live very close to the ocean, and you, you can go out to the ocean and just watch these ships go, go down below okay. the horizon. Anyway, my so, point was that this is... This is this argument was made by Newton and it existed prior to that. So it's I'm not sure how far back you could go with uh, uh, with this. I've never really researched that, but this is something you know. This idea of the pale 
um, and the spinning argument is is quite bold. Well, my understanding is that you know there was discussion of the inverse square law of gravity even before Newton. So I'm not sure he came up with the inverse square law himself. That was Hook. Yeah, yeah. But he did come up with calculus. He and Leibniz did come up with calculus. All right, let's let's move on. Um, so this says Einstein's general relativity, and I'm going to use EGR to refer to Einstein's general relativity for barmaids. Wheeler, there's a famous physicist named John Wheeler. He was uh, Feynman's graduate advisor. He says, matter tells space how to warp, warp space tells matter how to move. And I would think most people would consider Wheeler pretty much of an expert on general relativity. And then you have um, Einstein's, the main equation of general relativity, um, the stress energy tensor, the G mu nu is the uh, metric. I'm sure everyone knows all about that. Now, um, I'm not, I don't claim to be a big expert on general relativity, but it appears to me that Einstein's general relativity, EGR, doesn't, cannot explain the gyroscope, the spinning gyroscope. This is just my own personal opinion. For example, you, you've got this matter that curves space, but the space can't tell if an object is spinning or not. So EGR doesn't appear to be able to distinguish between spinning and non-spinning objects. So you have, you have this disc on a rod and you put it up there. If it's spinning, it'll, it'll stay horizontal, but if it's not spinning, it'll fall. So EGR, in my opinion, deals with geodesics, not with forces, whereas Newtonian mechanics deals with forces. So I don't know if you agree with this or not, but. My understanding is general relativity says there's no such thing as gravitational force. So they've sort of taken force. The concept of force doesn't exist in general relativity. Which I, I agree. It's all, it, it all is geodesics. You know that objects follow uh, the line in space time of, of maximum action or least action. I, I think it's maximum action in general relativity, whereas in classical physics is least action. Now you can you can reformulate Newtonian mechanics and give it a Lagrangian or Hamiltonian formulation where you kind of get rid of the force. Well, you deal with generalized forces, but that's beyond the scope of this talk. Let's, let's transition into Lathwaite, the infamous Eric Lathwaite. And I've given two of the um, URLs to discuss his uh, anti-gravity gyroscope. Lathwaite's gyroscope is, is a 13-inch diameter disc mounted on a shaft three feet long. The total weight of the disc plus shaft is 40 pounds. This guy from Veritasium, interesting guy, he's, he's, uh, he loves to you know, investigate these claims. He took a gyroscope, which is 19 kilograms, 40 pound flywheel on a shaft one meter long. So take your pick. I'm gonna consider a gyroscope because I'm gonna do some really elementary calculations. It has a disc of 30 pounds mounted at the end of a 10 pound rod of length 36 inches. I say 10 pound rod, uh, but later I'm gonna dis disregard the weight of the rod. So with the, with the gyroscope rod perfectly perpendicular to the ground, either spinning or at rest, it requires 40 pounds of force to lift the gyroscope. So I would say, does everyone agree with that? This is fairly easy for most men to accomplish, I would say. 40 pounds. 40. Okay. All right, now with the gyroscope rod parallel to the ground, with the rod horizontal, and with the disc at rest, rest, not spinning. The amount of torque T required to hold the rod parallel to the ground is given approximately by, and I'm gonna consider the force, the, the counter torque force to be applied four inches from the non-disc end. So we just have the torque, the resisting torque times four inches equals 30 pounds times 36 inches. So the torque would have to be 270 pounds. And I suggest that, that no normal male adult male would be able to do this. Okay, so let's, um, just so I understand this, we're clear. You're saying that if you tried to hold the gyroscope that's not spinning, okay, horizontally, you couldn't do it because it would just twist your arm and fall to the ground. 
It's not, yeah, it's not so much a matter of the force, it's a matter of the torque. Right. Because that's, that's because, why I'm, <clears throat> is what I said correct? That's my understanding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The torque would well, you see that in that second uh video of that guy from Veritasium. He has this uh muscle man come by and try to hold that thing horizontal and he can't do it. <clears throat> even when you even when you grasp the rod like halfway between both ends, it's still very difficult to hold it horizontal. And this force would be even larger if, if I took into account the weight of the rod, which I'm neglecting here. With the disc rapidly spinning, the amount of force required to hold or hold the rod parallel to the ground should be equal to the weight of the disc, obviously plus the rod. This is ignoring the torque required to keep the non-spinning rod horizontal. Uh, however, this amount of additional force is not that large. So you've, you've all seen these uh, demonstrations of gyroscope in the form of a, tire, of a bicycle wheel where they hook one end to a string, front, string attached to the ceiling, right? And they get the uh, bicycle wheel spinning really fast. And then the string is just holding up the bicycle wheel and the bicycle wheel starts precessing around, right? Have you seen that? So the string is just, in my opinion, I, I've never done this, but I've never weighed it. But in my opinion, the string is just holding up the weight of the bicycle wheel plus the rod. It's, it's not counteracting the torque. It's just supplying the force to keep that bicycle wheel up there. Here's a little interesting aside. How fast does the disc need to be spinning to keep the rod horizontal? I just thought that's kind of an interesting question. I, have, I don't really know the answer to that. I know that the slower it goes, the more the, that bicycle wheel will, will droop when it's connected to that string attached to the ceiling. You know what I'm talking about? And the slower will, the procession will be. So if you, if you have it going really slow, it'll just hang totally horizontally. The faster it's spinning, the more horizontal it be, will be. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now, are there any other forces that could help raise a spinning gyroscope above the presenter's head? And I, I, I just went wild brainstorming this, and I thought, well, maybe, maybe that disc is disturbing the air, which is uh, kind of a, supplying some additional force. Maybe there's a, maybe the Bernoulli principle is involved. Maybe it's helping to raise that thing. You know what the Bernoulli principle is? The faster the air is traveling above us in a slipstream above a wing, the less pressure there will be. Right. And some people, there's a big, huge argument in the literature over the past hundred years about what generates lift in an airplane. Some people say Bernoulli's principle. Some people say no, it's the, uh, it's just the uh, redirection of the airflow underneath the wing. You know, you, you have this airfoil that's hitting the air and it's forcing, it's redirecting the direction of the air molecules, and that's supplying the lift. And so there's been endless debate about what causes lift. And it, I, I tend not to believe the Bernoulli principle explanation because Bernoulli's principle really applies only to compressible flow, I think. And, in, excuse me, incompressible flow and air is, is not incompressible. How many people know about the Magnus effect? Well, I'm intimately acquainted with Magnus effect because my son is very involved in tennis and some other people in my family involved in tennis. Magnus effect is involved in causing the tennis ball to drop if you hit topspin. That's the reason why these, these bullets, these tennis players are hitting, don't go out of the court. They go up, then they, they start going back down over the net. And there's just a downward force caused by the rotation of the air around the tennis ball. Uh, one thing is, another effect that I thought might be involved is conservation of angular momentum. And when, when Lathwaite is dragging this, uh, this rod with the spinning disc, he's dragging it around him and there's, it's extended out from his body. There's a lot of angular momentum as he starts dragging this thing. Then when he uh, starts raising it above his head, well, then, you know, like the, like the skater, the, his angular momentum is going to increase because the moment of inertia is getting smaller. Also, uh, the, the tendency of the torque, I mean, the tendency of the angular momentum vector to remain fixed in space is going to help keep that 
gyroscope balanced above him. Just like, you know, you've, you, you've, especially if you could get it above your head and lock your, your, your skeletal bones in position, you know, kind of like these ladies you see in National Geographic, they'd have 100 pound bottles of uh, jars of water on their head. Probably hard to get it on top of their head, but once it's on top of their head, it's much easier to carry it there. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. For the past, um, I want to transition into this topic. Uh, for the past 40 years, I've been trying to uh, come up with an intuitive, well, let me, let me say that I, 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 there's an intuitive explanation of how objects stay in, in orbit above the Earth. Basically, they, they move sideways enough to compensate for their falling. And here's a little back of the envelope calculation of, uh, of orbital speed. For, for example, here, here you have this uh, idealized picture of the Earth with a radius vector r. And consider motion of an object in orbit in one second. In one second, it goes v. And uh, close to the Earth, objects drop at 1 half at squared, which is approximately 10 divided by 2, which is 5 meters in one second. So if we have, um, using Pythagorean theorem, if we have r plus 5, and then we quantity squared equals v squared plus r squared, and then we work it all out, we get that the orbital velocity is about 18,000 miles per hour. Very easy calculation. So for the past 40 years, I've been trying to find an intuitive explanation for the gyroscope. And I've visited countless websites looking for these an intuitive explanation, just like this is intuitive. And uh, the best <clears throat> I think I found is something I thought of myself. When the gyroscope is spinning and held with its shaft horizontal to the ground, half the gyroscope is falling toward the ground while the other half is rising in the direction away from the ground. This schizophrenic nature accounts for the fact that the axis is held horizontal to the ground. It's kind of in a state of schizophrenia. So you have half of the gyroscope is falling, half is rising. It can't decide what to do, so it just says, I'm going to stay here. Actually, the angular momentum vector will chase the applied torque vector precession, and then you can get further nuances called nutation and so forth. So that's all I wanted to say about gyroscopes. I mean, you can get really complicated. You can talk about Euler angles. You can talk about with angular motion, you can talk about principal axis theorem. You know, you have moments of inertia, three different moments of inertia through the three different axes and objects are unstable if they're rotating around the middle, the, the second intermediate axis. I mean, there's all sorts of complicated stuff you can do with angular motion, but this is just what I want to present today. Any questions or discussions? Well, I'm kind of um, surprised that you're interested in this topic. How did you get interested in this topic, David? In gyroscopes? Yes. Well, I'm a, I'm a physicist, so it's, <laughs> basic, it's a basic staple of physics. I realize that, but, uh, you know, a lot of people would probably just read the book and go, oh, okay, that's interesting, and then move on and not really question it. Well, I mean, this Lathwaite, Lathwaite thing, uh, got me thinking about it. And, and I said before that I've, I've always been trying to come up with an intuitive reason for the gyroscope to stay, uh, to resist gravity. I mean, and that is very, very anti-intuitive in, in my opinion. So you're saying that, that um, you know, I, I'm not really um, expert on this, but my understanding is that the, the, angular momentum vector doesn't want to fall towards the center of the earth and so it precesses around um you know it's it's falling but it's it's not really falling towards the center it's falling going around in a circle rather than going down towards the ground and right that, that's the standard thing and so um you know, that kind of makes sense, I guess, 
you're you don't agree with that is that what you're saying or do you think there's more to it that's not really clear no i'm just uh no no i i agree with uh torque equals a change in angular momentum with respect to time i agree with that i'm just i'm just saying it's kind of strange i mean uh I don't know. I, I'm just trying to come up with an intuitive reason for that. Oh, well, that's the barmaid thing. So you want, so you're saying you would like that the textbook explanation is kind of abstract, too abstract for. Well, maybe. Now, now Feynman, so I, so for example, Feynman in his Feynman lectures, are you familiar with Feynman lectures at all? Yes, I have the books. Um, I've tried, you know, they, they say that Feynman has an explanation for gyroscopes and uh, Feynman was infamous for his explanation. Some of them are correct and some are incorrect. <laughs> yes, he's, I know. He supposed supposedly gave an explanation for the gyroscope and I, I just didn't buy it. I, I didn't, you know, you can make a case that if you don't, uh, that you can't agree with something unless you understand it. So if you don't understand it, you can either agree or disagree with it. But um, I mean, that's, a, that's an insight that may be more important than we think. Um, I run into that a lot, you know, in these email discussions. You usually have problems with the first, the first issue. You can't agree on the first point, and then nothing proceeds after that. Um, so you're correct there, I think. So you're saying. There needs to be some uh, point of agreement at the starting point, and you're having difficulty with that. Is that no? I'm no. I'm just saying that I'm trying to understand why this guy Eric Lathwaite could so easily lift the gyroscope, and he and he says it's it has an anti gravity effect, and I'm saying it's not an anti gravity effect. That's that's the sum total of my discussion here. I'm just saying it's not an anti-gravity effect. There's no new force involved here. That's all I'm saying. There's no new force. Okay. I mean, some people postulate a fifth force and stuff, but I don't think there's any new force involved here. I'm not really sure I understand the essence of the controversy. It seems like um, Vertasium says, well, I'll just stand on a scale and show that the weight's the same, so therefore this re refutes what he's saying. And to me, that's kind of unsatisfactory because it sort of, if this guy was a physicist, um, I'm assuming that he's a physicist and not, uh, you know, not just some guy off the street who's playing a trick like uh, Harry Houdini. Uh, why is he you know, think that there's something here that's worth it, that's a note. I don't know who this guy is. Right, that seems, that seems to be a kind of a vacuum here. Maybe Dennis can tell us something. Well, if you look in uh, French's uh, Newtonian Mechanics, which is uh, used to be at MIT, or, uh, the, he was a professor, was a full professor at MIT. Uh, it gives uh, an explanation uh, with a, a two, uh, instead of having a wheel, you have a uh, two sp spokes and a little uh, and a round, point, essentially point mass at the end of each spoke, the same mass. And he analyzes that type of gyroscope, which is, that's a type, it's a... Uh, uh, who is this now? I didn't quite get that. AP French, F-E-R-E-N-C. Oh, the guy, yeah, okay. Okay. Newtonian Mechanics, I, the book is... I, didn't, I, I don't know about this book, so I haven't ever seen it. Yeah, well, you know, in case you want to ever look into it further, you might, uh, that be, might be a good place to start. Okay, uh, we're getting and, up toward, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say we're almost, I'm not sure how much time we have left, but we should be getting close to the end. Yeah, uh, we, we can start. We got another 35 minutes coming up, though. Right. 
I did have some comments that I wanted to make on um, the first part of your presentation, David. Okay. And, you know, and they're not really necessarily related to the gyroscope issue. Um, uh, uh, so we'll do, I guess we'll do that in the second half of the discussion phase. Okay. Um, now, why do you think that the gyroscope is schizophrenic? No, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just, uh, I'm just trying to come up with an intuitive reason for why it doesn't fall. And now, you, if you just do it math, based on mathematics, you know, the conservation of angular momentum and torque and all that, it just falls out of the mathematics. But I'm just trying to come up with a, a reason for why it stays fixed in space. That's all. I mean, if this doesn't satisfy you, then everyone is, is sat, satisfied with different beliefs or opinions. Okay. So, I, I, so you're looking for something that's deeper, but yet um, not um, abstract. Right. So if you go back, if you go back to this thing, this is, this is kind of intuitive to me why things stay in orbit if they go fast enough. It's very intuitive and satisfying. But when you hold a gyroscope that's spinning with one hand on the non-disc end and, and it doesn't fall over, why is that? Why is it? I mean, you could say, well, there's another force involved to counter the torque applied by gravity. You know, that could be a hypothesis. I think. Maybe well, you could say that, that a spinning object generates another force that counteracts the torque of gravity. I mean. Could, could oh, I see an idea. So I'm just thinking out loud. Uh, so anyway, you have the two different radiuses there. And of course, so what if you had uh, like a previous discussion uh, that we've had a few about a month ago where you had angular momentum uh, in, in uh, gases where the gas would hit a wall and the wall would observe, absorb and then tr put translational motion on that particular mo molecule. So what if, the radius we know is constant because it doesn't really expand, but however, an object that's spinning at a high rate of speed, I mean, if it expands just in the nanometers or the femtometers, it's still expanding. And so what if, um, I'm just saying that there, when you have part going up against gravity and it's out, but it's also got the spring stretch effect you know, on every molecule in the substance as it's going around the other way, and now gravity's helping it, the object, it, that energy can come back into the object, making it seem smaller, seeming to accelerate that part of the matter. Just an idea. And even if it's on just a macroscopic, when you multiply uh, distances of vibration, you know, like a vibration on top of vibration, let's just say there's a certain temperature of the metal. I'm just making this up as I speak, you know, it's just going on, you know, the vibrations. Well, as it's fighting gravity going up, maybe it's stretching as it's coming down. It's, you know, this, this, the net spring effect has a net force in. So it's kind of like, you know, absorption and a, a emission of energy internally. You know, it's just... I. I, I think I follow a little bit what you might be saying. In other words, when this guy, Lathwaite, is, is uh, the gyroscope is horizontal. Basically, he's dragging it around him, and he's giving it some kinetic energy. Then when he lifts this, this kinetic energy can be changed into potential energy. That's going to help him raise that gyroscope. Do you understand what I'm saying? He's, he's dragging this gyroscope around him, giving it some rotational motion and then using that rotational motion to help lift it up. Just like if you have a string with a, it's like you've got a yo-yo and the yo-yo is way down at the end of the string and you start spinning it around you and then you just change the direction and it's gonna go up very easily. It's gonna convert that kinetic energy into potential energy. Is that what you're talking about? Well, 
trying to I really I need a picture of the geometry because I can't tell Th this earth is so, you know horizontally up and down or you know you can see the picture where right. you've got a top and a bottom of the disc I can't see if that's the same orientation with the shaft going like to my eyes of the earth you know of yeah. this dumbbell spinning I don't know where it is right I my company's blocking YouTube, so I can't really see the YouTube video right now <laughs> of that one guy, you know, the, that, that's doing, you know, that you mentioned doing that experiment. Lathwait, yeah. Yeah, Professor Eric Lathwaite. Well, you know, uh, you're right, uh, David. Uh, if, as you uh, increase the precession angular velocity, the, the uh, gyroscope, you know, if it's spinning at a high rate of speed, tends to go up. And the more <coughs> you uh, accelerate the, uh, the precession, the, uh, the motion around in a circle, the higher the angular velocity, and it's driven, and if its derivative is positive, uh, it all tends to push the thing upward, like you said. Could we both go back to the beginning of your presentation? Sure. And talk about uh, Newton? Yeah. All right. Uh, we went by this. The barmaid issue, I want to comment on that. That was a point that um, you probably don't know who I'm talking about, but uh, Glenn Baxter used. Uh, Glenn Baxter, we had a, um, a Monday morning discussion group, and he, would re he recorded that. And, um, and he broadcast that on his radio station. But anyway, that's a whole nother story. Um, and he used to always talk about this barmaid point, you know, and every time people would start talking about complicated explanations, he'd always bring that up. So um, I'm pretty familiar with that, with that idea. And it kind of can become a roadblock if you're trying to explain something that, you know, the idea behind it is kind of difficult to to talk about or the the words behind it are are not as easily expressed as you would like um but i think the essence of it is is kind of basically occam's razor in a sense yeah there's a there's a you could ask a philosophical question if for example the philosophical question is if two people disagree, does that, doesn't that just indicate they don't understand each other's arguments? I mean, when, when, you talk, when you think about two people agreeing, I mean, when two people are discussing something, they're each bringing to the table their complicated life history because everything they've experienced in life is probably affecting their current opinion and current understanding. Maybe not everything, but a good many things in life are affecting their understanding and what it takes for them to agree to something, you know? Like the classic example is Democrats and Republicans talking about any issue. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so now what your point would be here at the bottom is something to the order of and um, uh, that the notion of a gyroscope is not really something you can explain to a barmaid. And, and I think that's really what your point is because I can see how you run into a real problem there. <laughs> yeah. Well, there, as I say, the French's book uh, is pretty intuitive. If you're looking for something intuitive, you might, and you can probably get it. It's. Uh, it's now, it's not, no longer used at MIT. And so uh, there are a lot of copies floating around that you can purchase used, you know. And I've never seen a copy of it. Can we move on to the next slide? I want to make a comment about Newton. Okay. Um, the, the pale the pale argument? No, the absolute space and time. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to comment on this and um, I looked into this, as you said, you tried reading the Principia. Some people say Principia, it's different from that. Anyway, so I ran into the same issue that you ran into. 
And I basically resolve this by saying Newton is talking about a mathematical space and a mathematical time. He's not talking about physical space and time. And the reason is because when you're dealing with mathematics, you have to basically talk about a coordinate system that in a sense is absolute. You can't have two coordinate systems simultaneously because that violates the uh, unique identity element system of mathematics. So if you think about uh, absolute space according to Newton and absolute time according to Newton, he's talking about mathematical um, objects. In other words, he want, he's talking about these uh, space and time in order to make them into a mathematical system. You can't talk about space or time, okay, mathematically if you don't make the, add an absolute concept into it. Do you understand that? Uh, I have some, <laughs> some understanding. Uh, some people say that you can't even make a coordinate out of time. It is well, kind of that's, that's where you get into the relativity issue. In other words, if I'm going to make a math model, so in other words, Newton is essentially um, uh, making a mathematical model. He's, he's uh, essentially trying to make physics into mathematics. And if we right. look at it that way, okay, it's almost impossible if you, if you allow relative, um, you know, the, the relative idea you can't really make that into a mathematical model. That's really what the issue is. And what um, Einstein does is he tries to do the reverse. He says, okay, um, I'm gonna make my model relative and it, that, it doesn't really work. But the physicists and the mathematicians really don't want to accept that fact. And I think this is the thing. Now, you got any comments on that? Well, yeah, some comments. Uh, I'd have to go back to Immanuel Kant. If, do you know anything about Kant, Immanuel Kant? Um, yes. Um, he. Uh, it's actually, you're talking about Leibniz's before Kant, but anyway. Well, um, the older I get, the more philosophical I get. And <laughs> I'm going back to Aristotle and so forth and Parmenides and Zeno brought a lot of good points, but Kant basically says that space may not actually even exist. It, it only exists in our imagination, but in order for us to experience reality, we have to have this concept of space. Um, you, you follow what I'm saying? That even makes it even more of a mathematical idea. Yeah. I mean, perhaps we, perhaps you and I and everyone else that's ever lived is just some sort of uh, simulation in God's computer, you know, and uh, right. <laughs> space is just a uh, holographic, uh, you know, projection of some sort. But I understand what you mean about mathematics. You know, it's just a mathematical concept. Well, let's go over to the, um, to the Newton's bucket. Okay, because you brought okay. up Newton's bucket. And um, okay, so this puts you, this is this whole business here, this whole, the, these two slides that you just talked about. I mean, there's just controversy. I spent a lot of time reading about this and trying to make sense of it. And so you're faced with this problem of, you know, well, space and time are not absolute, but then now you get to this problem of how is it that Newton's bucket you know, how, how is it that you can now talk about rotation that looks like that has to be absolute? So now you've got this contradiction of when you're talking about translation, space is not, uh, space is not absolute, it's relative, but when we're talking about rotation, space is now absolute. So this presents this, this uh, you know, to me, this is something that a barmaid would really be upset about if you tried to explain it to her. Well, you know, you could. Well, you, Harry, Harry, you could probably, you could probably grab a. Now, I don't, I don't go to bars. Uh, I don't drink at all. But you could probably grab a some uh, some glasses and 
pour whiskey in there and demonstrate it to the bar major. No, no, no. I'm not talking about this particular thing. I'm talking about the fact that, you know, on the one hand, when you're talking about translation, you're talking about everything's relative. But now when you're talking about rotation, now everything's absolute, you know, and, and you know, I think the average person just would find that irrational. Yeah, yes, and, but, but there has been some experiments done by, uh, 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 I can't think of his name, but uh, in the first chapter of uh, J.P. Wesley's Scientific Physics, uh, there is, he gives some experiments done uh, which uh, say that you can detect the velocity of the Earth and yourself, for that matter, through the uh, ether by uh, electromagnetic means. Yeah, you're referring to the um, uh, interferometer uh, gyroscopes, the laser gyroscopes, I think. Uh, no, I don't think so. I, this is written before. Uh, I, I don't think so, no. Uh, I'm saying that, uh, what is the guy's name? Let's see here. Well, anyway. Uh, okay, well, I think the point at issue is that... Um, uh, this whole idea of what space is is sort of essentially is essential to um, you know any explanation that you come up with in physics if you're going to try to present to a barmaid. <laughs> um, so, in other words, it seems like physics doesn't really have an explanation of space and how forces in space act. It's like well, have, Harry. <laughs> Harry, I want to I want to say something about explaining things to a barmaid. I think sometimes it'd be easier to explain to a barmaid than it is to explain to some expert that thinks he's correct with, but his his theory is incorrect. You know, I mean, you have to dismantle his theory before you can get him to listen. You know, understand yeah, what I'm saying? I, I, I know that. I know that. <laughs> My point is that what I'm trying to say is. But this seems to be what's this. This seems to be, you know, a, a problematical issue. Okay, right at the right at the get go with respect to mechanics, and then now when, and then what the way physicists sort of deal with it is they say, okay, it's all about mathematics, and then um, then now you're into the um, operational approach to, you know, you know what I'm talking about the operation, you know. Um, well, you can't talk they're, about they're, it because you have to define the method of measuring and then it becomes abstract and you're no longer talking about physical reality. You're talking about abstractions. Well, there's some physicists like uh, Tegmark, Max Tegmark, who believe that the ultimate reality of the universe is mathematics, you know? Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I'm not sure I buy into that. That, you know, um, yeah. Okay, uh, I'm not going to comment on that. All right, uh, the, so I have a, this is kind of my preliminary comments on, on what you've done here, which I think is interesting because it brings up a lot of the fundamental questions that you have to deal with. Yeah, it does, uh, because mechanics is a foundation that all of physics is built on. And if mechanics is wrong, everything's wrong. And it right. seems that mechanics is wrong, uh, at least uh, if you're familiar with an uh, engineer by the name of Gottfried Guski, he has a book, uh, Nurse Propulsion, and you thought it's impossible. And there he talks about a new mechanics he thought up and uh, some experiments that you can look up on YouTube to see that it's correct, you know, it's ver he verifies everything experimentally. Well, along that line, let me mention uh, this approach by, have you ever heard of uh, Andre Coke Torres at Assis? Yes. yes, yeah, Brazil. Uh, yeah, he's written this book, which I've read called Relational Mechanics, brilliant book. He relates everything to, he says everything is related, you know, his mechanics is relational. Very intriguing concept. Okay, and I have another comment that I want to go into here, which goes to the general relativity issue. Yeah. 
further. Okay, um, and, I, and I commented on this earlier about, I went to a presentation where, um, uh, by the way, I wanna mention this to you, Dennis, I don't think you know about this. We have a, a, um, an accelerator here in Newport News. It's called the uh, uh, Jefferson Lab. I don't know if you've heard of the Jefferson no, Lab. No, I haven't. I have, I've heard of it. And that's here in Newport News. And I went to there to a talk uh, this was a number of years ago, and the guy was talking about Einstein's theory of relativity, and so he was talking about all the usual special relativity stuff, and then, um, you know, and all the people in the audience were, you know, and then he made this comment where he said that there's no such thing as gravity, okay? That's yeah, the way he said it. There's no such, according to Einstein, there's no such thing as gravity, Yeah, and that was met with complete, utter People were just like, couldn't understand that at all. It didn't make any sense at all to them. Yeah, I know. I know. And, um, you know, after the talk was over and he invited questions, people basically were asking, you know, this doesn't make any sense. Okay, so what my point is, so now what we've got in general relativity is we've got a mechanics that doesn't have forces in it. Gravitational force doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. There's no yeah. real yeah. gravity. Okay. I mean, to me, this this is sort of getting far, even farther out. I mean, presumably, gravity is the is the essential feature of mechanics, because if we go back to what I was saying about Galileo, remember Galileo had this. Uh, um, business with the church, and I can't remember the cardinal's name, uh, who, um, who was involved in the investigation. And, um, you know, basically, one of the main things that, that they really didn't like about what Galileo said was he couldn't explain why the earth didn't fly apart. Okay, now most of the books and everybody ignores that, and they say the church was wrong, and it was a stupid decision of the cardinal to say that. But Galileo couldn't explain if what he said was true, he couldn't explain why the earth didn't fly apart. So that was the serious uh, flaw in his theory. Yeah. And my opinion is the church was correct in rejecting what he had to say because there was a major flaw in his argument. Now that was resolved by Newton's gravity theory. Okay, so, well, actually Gilbert. Um, yeah, Gilbert. Uh, William yeah. Gilbert. Gilbert said the earth is a giant magnet, and in Gilbert's theory, the reason the earth didn't fly apart was that because magnetism held it together. Okay, and then that was later changed when Newton came along and said, well, there's this force of gravity thing. Yeah. So now we're back to, there is no force of gravity. <laughs> I know, it, uh, it, you see, it's mathematics uh, taking over physics. Uh, Right. And, so well, that we, did, but that didn't start with physics. Mathem in mathematics, uh, they're, they're, uh, they refused to, uh, uh, they downgraded all s s branches of mathematics, which were insufficiently beautiful. Like, uh, and by beauty, it usually is meant symmetrical. Right. And uh, so, for example, I worked in uh, algebraic automata theory. That's what I wrote my thesis in. And uh, they don't like that because it's, 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 it's uh, not as pretty as, say, uh, special relativity theory, general relativity theory, which involves all kinds of symmetries and four dimensional spaces and so on. And, and uh, then it spread to physics. Uh, physicists then took the same point of view because uh, physicists tend to look up to mathematicians for some reason. And so they, uh, and this is all laid out in a book by uh, Sabini Hassenfelder called Lost in Math. It explains how uh, physics has become way too mathematical. And uh, you know, and now it's spreading downward into uh, high schools and grade schools where uh, they, uh, 
you know, anybody that that uh, destroys their serenity or their, you know, it makes them anxious or anything like that has to be canceled. <laughs> it's it's a uh, it's been a proceeding for years. Now it's finally gotten down to high schools and middle schools where, uh, you know, they're not clever enough to cover it up what's really going on. Um, I'm wondering what, I don't want to dominate the conversation here. Right? We, ahead, we're running out of time. David, do you have any comments on this? Um, <laughs> since you're a... Well, you know, this interesting what you said about force. Um, quantum mechanics is also another area of physics where they try to eliminate force. Yeah. Yeah, that seems to be a concept that's kind of disappearing, and that takes away the intuitive uh, understanding, I think. That because to go back to my point, when uh, the presenter said that there's no such thing as gravity. Um, and he sort of neglected to say gravity, gravitational force, which is kind of the important thing that you need to add into. People were just completely puzzled by that. They couldn't really, I mean, that just was completely unintuitive to them. So, you, so you'd have a whole room full of barmaids that are going like, this guy's, <laughs> you know, not making any sense. <laughs> Well, did he go on to explain that uh, Einstein replaced gravitational force with curvature? Is that what he? Yeah, he tried to, but it didn't really resonate. I think that's the real point. Um, that's know. a good. Um, that's a good term to use when two people understand each other. They resonate. You know, when you're reading a book that you understand, you you resonate with the book. Just like, you know, when you're you're pumping a swing. You, you apply the right, right frequency and, and you the swing goes higher and higher. I like that term, resonate. Yeah, well, I'm an electrical engineer, so I like it too. <laughs> <laughs> of course, uh, my, under, my, my definition of understanding is, is reaching in what I call an aha moment, A-H-A, -A, aha, you know, where you something just clicks in your mind and it makes sense. That's what I, how I define understanding. Oh, yeah. Okay. So Slobodan has made some comments in the chat. And then, then you give gravity is affected of uh, the inflowing ether pressure gradient. So now we have a ether explanation of gravity. That sounds like uh, Lesage's. Uh, it sounds like Lesage's explanation for gravity. And second line goes, then you could explain it to the, to the barmaid but maybe not to you, Harry. <laughs> well, um, the issue here, I think, is that um, in, the, in the case of the demonstration, the question is the gyroscope doesn't fall and it appears to be defying gravity according to this lathe weight demonstration. And he's sort of appearing to defy gravity. And um, so that means we need to know what gravity is, but that apparently is the one thing we don't know. <laughs> but it, it, uh, it Martin, also, Martin it also have, uh, longitudinal, it, you know, it has it has also longitudinal precession. Otherwise, the Boeing gyroscopes up there would not work, right? The Michael Gamble group uh, designed those that system, right? How it works. It works based on the addition of the longitudinal uh, how I say tendency of, of movement that is kind of um, kind of precession, right? Right. So you well, know, we were we were it, talking it, about it, that earlier. You know, that you know, it, I, I apologize for this, you know. Uh, the, the, then the gyroscope it, doesn't really fall to the earth, it move it goes around in a circle instead of falling towards the earth. Okay, Harry, uh, Harry, okay. I said, no, no, I will. I mean, I, I don't expect for you to, to, to go along those lines to understand it, okay? Please, I, I made this comment maybe uh, more, more for, for, the, for the Harry. I sent him one email and maybe for, for Daniel also, right? Yeah, I, I just read it. Okay, I'm, I found it. Okay, now it says, uh, time is now lost in, in math. 
Oh, well, yeah, laugh out loud, good point. It is not losing mass, right? It is interacting with the inflow of ether. So the interaction of inflow of ether and the, that part of ether that, that the wheel is, is, is dragging with it, right? That, uh -huh. that, that, that Bernoullian pressure is pushing it to the laterally and up and longitudinally, you know? There are three, there, there are three components of the force, right? And there is no any of them except the gravity within the, 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 the equations that model the, the gyroscope, right? And there is a guy who at least models it well, but the physicality is missing. And I really kind of appreciate the, 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 the David's, how say, uh, attitude toward really understanding the physicality behind it. And I think I can, uh, I, I can contribute to that. If you want to be pre, uh, what, what, what we're having that prejudice uh, regarding the, 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 the accent and the language and so on and so on, right? And even not, not reading chats, not reading the papers, not, not, not reading the, the presentations, nothing, nothing. Just continue thinking and enjoy. Thank you. Okay. Uh, also, you know, the new Newtonian theory that I uh, discussed two weeks ago also applies to uh, life wave gyro and predicts uh, uh, a weight loss, but not as big as the one that occurs. Uh, however, uh, I had to make some simplifying assumptions. Uh, if you watch the Latheweight video very carefully, you'll notice that he moves the handle of the gyro with his hand at it in, in uh, very clever ways. And uh, it was, if you think back to uh, Wait, uh, Richard Waite's uh, uh, gyroscopic experiment where he found 8% weight loss, uh, he achieved that by moving the handle of the gyro uh, the, uh, upward at a certain velocity in order so to keep the thing from mutating so it would only precess. And that's how he got the 8% weight loss using conservation of energy and then measuring it too with the machinery. Uh, so, so I think the key to understanding Latheweight's gyro experiment, the one that uh, where he had 40 pounds over his head and hardly straining is he moved the handle of the gyroscope in just the right way to uh, uh, cause huge weight loss, just as uh, weight moved it in, in a very special way, upward, directly upward, and at a certain velocity in order to get his weight loss. The, the weight loss is from uh, different factors, like the fact that he whips it around him, which causes uh, weight loss too a little bit maybe even quite a bit. But uh, there's also the, if my Newtonian theory is correct, there's a, also a Newtonian effect which causes weight loss. But I, my calculations are oversimplified because if you, you, if you have the handle of the gyro moving in clever ways, uh, you've got to know the trajectory in order to plug into the formulas. Right. And then even then, you have to have a, a supercomputer, a much faster computer than the one I've got, to uh, calculate the thing correctly. So to summarize what you said is, I didn't see the Veritasium video, but I'm assuming the Veritasium didn't do any um, flipping around of the, I, I think that's a, he didn't really reproduce what Lake, Lathwaite did, is that correct? Uh, yeah, more or less he did. Yeah. I've never well, seen the Veritasium if you, video. Let, let, me, let me comment about the Veritasium video and how it's a little bit different. He, in the Veritasium video, it seems like he didn't lift the gyroscope completely over his head. He didn't get, in, get it into a completely horizontal or uh, r rather a completely vertical orientation with, with respect to his body. Whereas Lathwaite, it seemed like he got it more more vertical above his head than than the Veritasium guy did. Okay. Well, Lathwaite, uh, 
I think must have practiced for a long time before he figured out just how to move the handle around and just how to whip it around him and so on. Uh, he must have uh, done a lot of uh, work in private to maximize the effect. And he, the effect was so powerful that they were questioning whether or not he had uh, gone in league with the devil in order to do it. And so they ostracized him as being uh, evil, I guess. So he's more like a Houdini. He's using a physical reality and um, to do a, what appears to be a magic trick, but really is based on physical uh, laws. But we don't well, know what the physical laws be, are. It has to be based on physical laws. But yes, you're right. Uh, he, uh, he, he noticed a few things and he computed a few things, which some of which he published probably a lot, which he didn't. And, uh, you know, he, uh, he was a showman, like Houdini, Harry Houdini. <laughs> Who was a showman? Uh, Lathway. Lathway. And, yeah, he's uh, got some other, he's got some other videos where he demonstrates other things about gyroscopes. Yeah, so yeah, he, he does. He did like right. a Christmas lecture of 1964, something like that. Uh, 84, maybe. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he obviously did a lot of work, uh, but uh, to uh, calculate things, even if using just cl classical mechanics, and you've got, you, you're moving the handle of the gyro in a very special way, and, you know, you have to, by, uh, you have to do experiments, you'd have to see just how he moved it. You'd have to know the trajectory of the handle. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and somehow crank that into the other um, uh, physics of the gyro. Well, it's, it wouldn't be an easy thing to compute, I can tell you that. Especially in those days, they didn't have uh, the computing power that we have now. <laughs>